had uh, hearing difficulties, we would all be doing this now, in a way to tell each other that actually it was time to be quiet. Uh, I, hello everybody, my name is Catherine Gamble, I am the professional lead for the Royal College of Nursing and this is the 25th time that uh, I have attended this conference. I nearly didn't get to one of them over the last 25 years uh, because I was stopped at Vauxhall when I was in my car by the police and they said, you're driving a Jaguar. I said, I'm not, I'm in a Mini. You can see I'm driving a Mini. Uh, I, to my absolute amazement, for the last six months or so, I'd been driving around in a new Mini that apparently had been registered as a Jaguar car. So I was about to be taken off to, um, off to prison uh, for breaking the law, um, but fortunately, a very, very nice um, uh, young policeman said, I can see that your, your, um, uh, your car registration number and your, your logbook doesn't match. So that meant, although I was nearly three and a half hours late, I still got to the conference. Um, and I have to say that this conference, over those 25 years or so, has provided me with the most amazing professional network, amazing professional friendships that are almost irreplaceable. For those of you who are very much new into the career, I would suggest that this is a very good place to come and find your colleagues as you peek and trough through some of the diversities of being a mental health nurse, this is one of the areas that I have given, been given real solace and support from. I know that I used to work here some years ago when I set up the first mental health degree programme here. And I was not got, I didn't get funding to go to a conference that was in Vancouver, which was the International Congress of Nursing. And I went down to, um, at that point, to smoke in the smoking room. Uh, shows how long ago it was. And I went down and colleagues there said, we're from international part of the organisation of the Royal College of Nursing, why don't you come and help us run the stand at the ICN and then you can present your paper. So when it's those sort of little conversations that you can have that start to stimulate. So I would suggest that for those of you who are coming to dinner tonight and also talk to somebody that you wouldn't normally talk to because this is, can build all sorts of wonderful networks and huge levels of support. Before I introduce um, uh, Ricardo Arara, I'm just going to have some, a couple of things that we need to say. First of all, um, 2.3 in your programme, page 10 of your programme, says that the room will be 307, when in fact actually it isn't. It's going to be 313. And the other point to note is that some of you may well have been seeing sort of people furiously tweeting. Um, could we make sure that um, uh, if you're furiously tweeting, we want London, come on, we have to beat Cardiff. <laughs> and, and, um, the mental health was um, told us this morning that uh, we have, uh, that Cardiff has won over a number of years around social media, so let's get on with that. Could I also just ask, would you indulge me to something, that students who are helping the mental health, would you mind standing up and just waving to us all? Are you here? There they are, there's two of them. Three, one of them. Thank you very much. There are actually five or four of them, but uh, with, with somebody must be up. So, and there's the mental health as well. So there are five people. So we'll get an opportunity to do it. And the other thing, just before I introduce uh, um, the next speaker, is just could I ask the committee members to stand up? Uh, people who have been behind the scenes squirrelling away, don't just include those people who are at the registration desks. There are a number of us on the committee. Could I ask people to just show your name, the, who you are, and just stand? Um, there should be Tim, there should be Fiona, there should be... Yes, yeah, so wave. These are your committee members. So they can now ask lots of questions and I can go and hide. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so now, uh, by, um, uh, now, I'd like you to refer to page 18 
of uh, your, your, and that's because we have now got the pleasure of meeting and hearing Pro Professor Ricardo Arara. And he's from King's College and is the director of, of the Centre for Global Mental Health. And um, very mindfully, you've said that you are nervous about three quarters for now, but I'm sure you're going to use it very wisely and ask us all sorts of things and challenges in all sorts of ways. So welcome. Thank you. I'm not sure if you can hear well at the back. Uh, I'm partially deaf, so I always check that. Um, I have a, a strange accent, so I'll, if you find it difficult to understand what I'm saying, just stop me and I'll reboot my brain and try to do it better. Okay. Um, well, first of all, thank you so much, uh, Catherine and members of the organizing committee to, for, for the invitation. <coughs> Um, it, it, is, um, it is a privilege, really. Um, this is the first time I've come to uh, a meeting of the College of Nursing. Not because I didn't want to, it's just because I've never been invited. Um, <laughs> and and I, I'll say why, you know, because uh, you know, most of my work is in uh, low and middle income countries. And in low and middle income countries, although I train as a doctor, um, the people that I work with are not doctors. Uh, because there are no doctors in, in most cases, but there are very few doctors. And, um, oh, there is a microphone. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> so that means that I'm not going to be able to walk around. Um, I thought it was my chance to kind of think that I was in a TED talk or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people here. Uh, anyway, but that, this makes uh, life a lot easier for many of you. Um, it, it is really a privilege uh, because uh, in most of those places where I work, um, services are not run by doctors, they're run mostly by nurses. Uh, so the nurses are all really take the leading role. And then there are a lot of other people, you know, professionals and non-professionals, that do most of the work. Not just in mental health, but in health in general. So um, I'm interested. I've always been interested, and uh, I've been trying, to, as you will see as I go along with my talk, most of the things that I've done through my uh, professional life, I've been trying to identify where uh, there is a resource, and what can we do with that resource in terms of providing a service for people who need it. So that's been my mode of, uh, of life for the last 30 or so years. Um, so I'm pleased to be here and, and share some of it with you. I'm sure uh, feel free to interrupt at any time with comments or questions or whatever. Um, this is my experience, um, so not necessarily your experience. So I'll be interested to hear what your reactions are. Um, so uh, let's start by saying something which is pretty obvious: there is no help without mental health. Um, it's in fact it was part of the definition. Um, uh, Alma Atta, you know, in 1948, and, uh, and it's been there in all the documents from uh, WHO, uh, at least on the paper, uh, that mental uh, is part of the definition of health. So there is no health without mental health, by definition. But as you will see, uh, the paper can take a lot. Um, so what is it that I want to tell you a little bit about it? Uh, well, a few things, just for you to reframe, it's one o'clock, uh, you need a little bit of reframe in your head, I guess, uh, so do I. Um, so first of all, I want to address the issue, is there a, a problem or not? And then, if there is a problem, um, as you may agree or disagree with me, what can be done about it? And finally, just to kind of invite your brains to reflect on some of my work and the work of other people in this field. Um, and what is likely to happen in the future? So let's start with, is there a problem? Well, if you look at the um, uh, statistics, this is uh, based on the Global Burden of Disease, Institute of Health Metrics in the US, which is what replaced WHO in a way in terms of providing the official statistics. So what you see there is essentially that uh, mental health, uh, 
occupies the fifth position in the ranking in terms of the contribution to the global burden of disease. But when you look at year leave lived with disability, it is by far the highest. So, um, and if you look at the three last, the three main contenders uh, next to mental health, uh, you know, cancer, um, I can't remember what the other one, uh, neonatal disorders, uh, no, yeah, neonatal disorders, they all come roughly about the same. So, if, you know, mental health are only beaten by cardiovascular diseases um, and infectious diseases in general. So, and when it comes to disability, they are very prominent indeed. So, in terms of the numbers, it really shows that uh, we seem to have a problem. Okay, um, is the problem getting better or is it getting worse? Well, if you look at the numbers again, and they came in the last commission recently, and it's based on data from the Institute of Health Metrics, again. What you see is that the numbers are rising. So the level, the prevalence of mental condition is increasing everywhere in the world. But as you can see, it's increasing even more in low and middle income countries. But there is no country where the problem of mental health is decreasing. In every country, it's increasing. So when it comes to mental health, and I never stop saying this thing, there are no low or developing countries and developed countries. All countries are developing, no matter how much money they have in the coffee. It's, it's something that uh, is worth bearing in mind. Now, there is a big problem, is increasing. So what? Are we dealing with this or not? And the reality here is very striking. We are failing badly, not in lower and middle income countries only, although the failure there is much more noticeable than in high income countries, but we are failing everywhere. Because if you think that in this country, you know, six out of 10 people with depression get any form of treatment, is not something to rejoice. It doesn't, you know, in the US, it's not different either. Um, but of course, in low and middle income countries, the gap is much wider. Um, it is estimated that one, depending on countries, uh, you know, you, you have to realize low and middle income countries is a combination of so many different places. But between one and two people with a depression will get any kind of treatment whatsoever. So that's the reality of the world when it comes to treating uh, this very prevalent condition. And now, just to round up that point, if you look at um, the mental health burden and the level of investment that governments are putting into it, well, Again, no country, no matter how wealthy it is, escapes from this reality. You know, we are not putting the money into it. That is the reality. And it doesn't really matter if it is here, or in Lesotho, or in Zimbabwe, or anywhere. Of course, in those countries, the situation is much worse than here. But let's not be misguided. We have a problem here, uh, and I, I just want to emphasize that. Now, just to kind of begin to prepare the ground for what can we do about it, uh, let me just share this with you. What you see here is not really important. What you do not see here is what it is important. And what you do not see is any kind of human resource that can help with mental health problems in any of the low income countries. I mean, basically, whatever the health resource that you look at, there is virtually nothing in low, low income countries. 
a little bit in lower middle income countries, and of course, much more in higher income countries. This is data from 2007, it's not you know, the most recent one, but the reality hasn't changed that much. And if you look in there, you know, um, there is one, obviously, the category in there is psychiatric nurses, that, which is a sort of specialized category, and I accept that. Um, not necessarily your colleagues in lower, low income, low and middle income countries who are dealing with mental health problems are not necessarily psychiatric nurses, there are general nurses. I accept that. But the reality is that there are virtually very few human resources. And human resources, when it comes to treating mental health problems, are essential. You know, unfortunately or fortunately, we represent the treatment in many ways. You know, leave aside things like medication, which in fact I would not, you know, for medication you require an interaction with a human resource. The medication is not something that falls from the sky because you have depression. Somebody has to kind of assess you, diagnose you, there is a human resource involved and then makes a decision with you as to whether or not you want to take a pill. So getting rid of the human resources is a complicated thing. The problem is that we don't have the human resources. So how are we going to deal with it? Now, I wanted to, I did a little bit of reading and I was really interested on uh, the situation of nursing uh, in the world. And uh, a little bit kind of sort of also in this country. Uh, of course, these are kind of those things that fell in my brain, which is obviously very biased. <laughs> so you may think that, you know, you are kind of, <laughs> you know, picking little things here and there. You know, it's true, I did that. But, you know, I thought it was interesting, you know, that half of the health workforce <coughs> is made up of nurses. I mean, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's amazing, you know, the number of nurses that are, that are around the world. Um, and, like, without any other human resource, there's a tremendous shortage. In 2014, they predicted, you know, I can't remember how many millions. I was reading uh, last night a paper on these that say, like, sort of, uh, the level of human resources which are required in India by the year 2030. And it was something, staggering numbers, something like in the order of 1.5 million, and in China, close to 2 million people, uh, health workers. Uh, I just, you know, I, I, I couldn't believe that it could be true, you know, but obviously, you know, when you have 2 million people, um, 1.8, you know. It's possible. Um, and then, you know, I couldn't stop because, you know, and, uh, and there is no, I don't want anyone to feel that I'm pointing the accusing finger to anyone. Uh, I, as many of you here, I suppose, uh, migrated to this country. Um, I was trained in another country, and I came to live here. Uh, it, it doesn't, I always came to, uh, with the idea of what I wanted to do. And what I wanted to do it was to work in you know, global health, and I wanted to work with the people that, that needed the most. So I haven't deviated from that. So I don't think I am a waste resource for the cost of the low income countries. I think I've contributed, and I continue to contribute, and I will probably will do until the end of my day. Um, but uh, the reality is that a lot of people move around. And, and who am I to say to people you must not move around? Uh, I know, I go, I travel, I work. I've worked in 40 something countries around the world. I've seen people, uh, I know the condition of working. And I can understand very often when people say to me, you know, I'm going to leave. I want to have a better future for my family and stuff like that. So I don't want to accuse. But the reality is that people move from one place to another. And let's not forget that there is competition in this market. So what the UK used to do in the old days, that we were very attractive as a, a source of coming, 
for people um, who wanted to work in the NHS. Um, it may no longer be so. There are some other places. I was looking, um, if my curiosity, you know, and I'll show you, I, I'm not sure if I put the numbers, um, but I was looking at something at the salaries of um, nurses in competing countries. Australia, US, UK, and it's quite uh, interesting, you know. I, 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 played, I, I did put a lot of attention on one particular group, and I'll tell you later what it is and why. Um, but, you know, it didn't come to my surprise when I discovered that there were many, when looking for news about what is the UK doing in terms of this shortage of nurses. And I may be wrong, you know, but it, well, obviously that was in the newspaper. It, it's just, you know, it may be one very biased piece of information. Uh, but certainly, the UK is it, looking for nurses. Uh, and in a very active way. I don't know if it is as forceful as the article uh, presented, um, I, but it is understandable. What I thought it was interesting in one in the previous slide is that I put it in there, is that there are some countries that tend to develop a policy uh, that makes them less reliant on foreign uh, health workers. Um, I, it, I, I was interested to see that the Netherlands seems to be in terms of nurses, the number one in terms of you know, self-sufficiency. Um, but here in the UK, we've relied, although the numbers, I have to say, I was interested to see the numbers, the number of nurses according to the figures. There is a report from the Royal College of Nursing on that recently published. Um, although it is a lot higher than in many other countries, it's not as massive as I thought it would be. Um, but there we are, you know, we are looking uh, to attract these people. But these nurses, you know, um, they have to go from some place and they leave space unoccupied. Um, it's the tough job. They are seeing hundreds of people in a day. Uh, they come and work in here. Maybe they get a better job. Maybe. Maybe yes. Maybe not. Um, and then. Um, but what happened to those left behind, it's, you know, the price to pay for some of these things. So can something be done? You know, many years ago in 2012, um, I discovered this thing on a plane. I'm not subscribed to The Economist, although I think it's an interesting journal, I have to say. Um, and I bumped into this, and there was an article in there about squeezing the doctor out. And this article referred to the United States of America. And essentially, it was predicating the idea of task shifting. And it said, I've removed and I've left only one side of the task shifting. I'll come back to the other side a little bit later. So this is the human side of the task shifting. People now use the word task sharing, uh, which is a politically correct way of rephrasing something in my opinion. I mean, you know, it's um, whether it is shifting or sharing uh, is, you know, you can write a book about that. And I would say, you know, in most of the low-income countries where I go, it is task dumping. <laughs> uh, I'll be honest with you. Uh, but I was interested, you know, this article said that 85% of the duties of a general practitioner can be done by a decision system. Uh, and I was really struck by that. <laughs> Assertion, really. Because uh, if 85% can be done by a decision system, well, well I mean, I mean, this is what we've also seen in most low-income low countries. But the difference between low-income countries and the US is that in low-income countries, those decisions are made not by choice or by the reason of saving money. They are made because there is no other way of doing it. You know, that's the result you have. There's nothing else. 
in the US, here in the UK, or other you know, high-income countries, you know, it's more of a choice, to some extent, more of a choice, whether or not you will make a very bold decision and decide to replace a lot of the general practitioners with physician assistants or the equipment you hear, which I think they're called uh, advanced nurse practitioners, right? Um, so in our work for the last 20 something years, this has been our main really um, strategy, the so-called task shifting, task sharing, which in fact, it's, it doesn't come from us. You know, there's been task shifting, sharing, or whatever, or dumping for the last 50 years. You know, The whole immunization program in the world one of the most successful preventive interventions ever undertaken by the human being. It was done in a task shifted way. Very few doctors involved. There were other people, you know, going around village after village, you know, putting the jobs and these and that, making sure that people were immunized. So there's nothing new. We came late. It's a, it's a story of Johnny came late Great for us. Uh, but, you know, it takes us a while, and we reacted in the end, and, and, and we discovered that there is something in there. Now, when you think about task shifting, sharing, or dumping, uh, there are lots of options, right? And it can never stop. So initially, it was the idea, as I said, with the physician assistant, you know, transferring tasks from the doctor to the nurses, but then the nurses discovered that they could transfer some of the tasks to auxiliary nurses and auxiliary or assistant nurses, and assistant nurses thought that they could transfer some of their tasks to community health workers, and community health workers thought, well, why not asking community leaders to? Or peers, or, or, or whatever. Now, in our view, and our strategy in the global mental health sort of sector, all of them are okay. Whatever there is an existing resource that you can use, provided a few things. And those are the important things. You have to, and you will see in a minute, that these are the main problems that we encounter with this strategy. You have to provide you know, training for the people. You have to equip the people with the tools that they need to do what you're asking them to do. You have to provide some way of supervising. So there are a number of things that need to be in place for a task shifted cascade to come alive. So it's not that simple. But it is a strategy which is at least on the paper viable for most countries, including our country, by the way. Yes, I said I would come back to this because um, um, I find it quite interesting, you know, the growth of this, especially in high income countries. I mean, you probably, for those of you who work or live in some low, low income countries, you'll find that in many countries they already have physician assistants or whatever way you want to call them. So, and essentially there are most of them are nurses that have been received additional training and they are acting as doctors because there are no doctors. Uh, in some places they're allowed to do more things, in some places they're allowed to do less things. Uh, one of the key critical things in most places is the medication thing. Medication is kind of like uh, the, where you draw the line in terms of power, you know, to be perfectly honest. Uh, because to be perfectly honest, you know, a lot of the medication we use in mental health is not that complicated. It's not that complicated. You know, of course you need supervision and this and that, you know, but if, you know, prescribing, you know, our medication is not that complicated. We've done it, we've tried it in many different places, we look at you know, the potential side effect and things. And, you know, there's no way that, that um, 
allowing people, trained people to prescribe medication um, causes more damage than the benefit that brings. At the end of the day, that's the biology of this trial. Some examples, very quickly. We've done this thing for many years as said. This was the first one where I became interested, and it was done in Chile. And we've used different people in terms of the past uh, transferring, if we can put it that way. Uh, this was the first one I really got you know, heavily involved, and it was in the country where I was born, in Chile, and it was probably the first and most successful one. Um, and it essentially, why it is such an important thing is because such a small randomized controlled trial led to the introduction of a national treatment program. Uh, believe it or not, there are very few uh, programs, mental health programs, that have been scaled up at a national level in lower middle income countries. I don't want to tell you the number, but believe me if I say that I can count it with one the fingers of one hand over the last 20 years. So although we do have more evidence now in terms of randomized controlled trials, the step from there to scaling up was still miles away from so it was a, a program, and then essentially we counseled said to the doctors in primary care that were many, you know, your role is to prescribe medication, that's it. But you're gonna be managed by a nurse or a social worker. So that person will contact you when you're needed, and if not, that person will provide support, and there was a group intervention for the women that were, I, it was only for women that were identified as having a cognitive disorder. And then it was the decision of that nurse or social worker. They were trained in an algorithm to make, you know, facilitate uh, the work and make those decisions. If that person would be the liaison person with the doctor in case that person thought medication probably needed to be assessed. The results were incredible, and that's why, you know, it, re it really reverberated all around because you know it was possible uh, it wasn't the we didn't reinvent the wheel we just improved what we had and if you look in there you know essentially at three months 50 percent of the women had recovered not improved had recovered had gone below the threshold of clinical depression which is a lot more difficult than just simply improving as like sort of dropping 50 percent from the baseline questionnaire it's a lot tougher and by six months, 70% have recovered. So that brought a lot of hope that something could be done to improve things. So many things happen in between, but I wanted to show you this one because it's the latest one that I've been involved in. It's uh, really, for some reason, and I, know, I think I know the reasons and I'll share them with you, it has had a massive repercussion. And this is in Zimbabwe small country uh, in Africa, southern Africa. And, uh, and as you see in there, essentially, really, of all the information you see in there, the most important is that there are no psychiatrists, you know, there's virtually one per million people, I would say less than that. Uh, most of the primary care, I mean, I know there are some people here in the audience that have worked in Zimbabwe. Uh, can you show me who they, is there anyone here where Fiona did, has done, you've done work too in Zimbabwe. You know, so Zimbabwe, it's, a, it's an interesting place, actually. I've been working there for something like eight to 10 years now. It's an interesting place because they still have a primary care infrastructure. Uh, they don't have doctors there. Doctor comes, you know, once a week or so, that's the kind of thing. But the show is run almost entirely by nurses in primary care, the whole thing. Uh, but nurses do have some people assisting so our task, when we approached the primary care, we said we want to do something to help people who may, that may have a mental health problem. And you know, obviously all the nurses immediately reacted and they said, no, don't look at us. Okay, you know, we have no capacity, we can't do that. Uh, and they said, no, 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 just help us identify someone in here who may have some capacity to deliver a talking kind of therapy. 
So we worked with them, identified, and we came in the end to these uh, women. You see one there sitting. This is why they call the friendship bench, because they sit on a wooden bench outside. The, the, the fact that we went for a wooden bench outside the premises is not just random, by the way. It is because there is no room inside the clinic with sufficient privacy to talk about this thing. That's why we came. It, it was an our solution. It was a local solution. They told us how to do it. Oh, well, you, know, you can do this, you can do that. Well, in Africa, you know, it's not unseen or unheard of, you know, that you, you put a, you know, a seat under a tree, you get shade, and then, you know, you can talk about all kinds of things, you know. Okay, well, if that's you think what we can do, that's where we will go with. It. In fact, you know, this was done with a lot of steam by William, so, you know, I was very peripheral to the whole thing, you know. I, probably my role was more to do with the methodology of the research. Uh, they decided everything in terms of what kind of treatment, how, and this is the most important thing, not the type of treatment, how it can be delivered. Because this is the key thing, you know, how to do it more than what to do it. How to do it. And uh, so they told us, you know, the way to do it, and then they came the lady health workers, which eventually, because of their age, most of them are over 50, um, that makes me very old, actually, but anyway. <laughs> so they called my friend Dixon, Shivanda is the person leading all of this. So he decided to call me grandmothers, the grandmother ceremony. So we would go around at the beginning, I thought it was a joke, what he was saying, you know, but no, no, no. He, he really, and he used, uh, Dixon is a, if you've met Dixon before, you know, he's a very charismatic guy and very smart. And he kind of sort of cultivated the idea of the grandmothers. And that captured the imagination of the press in the West in such a massive way, I couldn't believe it. There were articles in every newspaper, I think I've got one here. Um, I'll show you that in a minute. Yeah, that was in The Guardian. Full page on the grandmothers. Uh, New York Times. You know, full page on the grandmothers in Zimbabwe. You know, this is the way that we're going to beat depression. Um, and he has become a, a celebrity now. You know, he's invited to all those places where neither you nor I will ever be invited, like you know, Davos and, and you know, checking hands with the royalty and all those things. Um, but that wonderful, I mean, it's such a wonderful thing that, you know, something like this attracts the attention of people. You know, it was badly needed. So these, these are the results of the study, uh, which we published in a very good journal. Um, and essentially, whatever way you look at it, one is the SSQ, which is a, a Zimbabwean questionnaire, and the other one is the PHQ. <coughs> whatever way you look at it, I mean, there was a massive drop in the intervention compared to the control. So the next step was obviously to offer to scale this up, um, which is happening. And we are involved at the moment in uh, an evaluation of the scaling up of the friendship bench in Harare and, and three other provinces now in Zimbabwe. Not the best time for those of you who've done things. <laughs> context, context, context is always the key. Not the best time to try to do this thing in Zimbabwe unfortunately. Uh, but you don't choose your time, but if you can choose your timing, great, you know, always be inspecting, you know, you learn as you get older, like me, you learn to kind of smell when there is an opportunity, you know, in the air. And, uh, and if the timing is right, it's the jump for it, essentially. Um, we've done similar kind of things in many different places. This was in Colombia. One thing I, I put in my slide before, but I don't know if you <coughs> noticed that. If you look at the workforce in low and middle income countries, 90% are women. 90% are women. Uh, very few men involved. I mean, you know, it's funny this one because, uh, you know, 
my friends always crack a joke on that one and say, you know, look at you got you got only other than you in there, you know, sneaking for the picture. Um, there is only one man in there and he looks so unhappy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm not sure he is that unhappy, you know. <laughs> but anyway, you know, <laughs> I was happy. <laughs> uh, this is in Brazil, similar kind of thing. The people you see in here, by the way, are um, called auxiliary nurses. The primary healthcare system in Brazil, I don't have time to explain to you, but it's, it's fantastic. It's very structured. So they have the nurses, and it's, it's, it's a family health system, really. So the, the, you know, there are one or two nurses per team, and then below that, you have three or four uh, assistant nurses, and then you have a bunch of auxiliary nurses, and then uh, many more community health workers. These are auxiliary nurses uh, sitting in there. Um, there is a nurse in there, by the way. You probably, who do you think is a nurse? It isn't wife. Yes. <laughs> She's a nurse. I don't think it's in. Is it working? Oh, it is working. The guy here told me, you don't press the right one because I don't know what will happen. <laughs> <laughs> I thought if I press it, maybe it will be self-destruction, you know? <laughs> I'll be blown up, you know? <laughs> well, I think it will be a good way of finishing my days. <laughs> Traumatic. <laughs> so that's all right, I'll press it again. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, this is the head nurse of that clinic. Uh, and she's the, uh, the head doctor for that clinic. Um, in Guatemala, we've done different things. You know, you find all these people in Guatemala, these are called lay uh, what lay midwives. Uh, and the funny thing about this is that in Guatemala, they deliver 90 something percent of all deliveries in Guatemala, in rural Guatemala. And, and these women, it's a gen it's, it's, the, the, the skills are transferred generation after generation. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I was really amazed with that. Because there was in here, the, that was the grandmother, that was the mother, and that was the daughter. Three generations, and it's transferred one generation to another. And these are the people who were delivering the babies in Guatemala. Uh, in Uganda, this is another group from the US, um, Bolton and Judith Bass. They did um, group therapy for depression in Uganda with incredible results in villages, rural areas, again, rural areas of Pakistan, treating postnatal depression. This is my friend, Adi Rahman from Liverpool University. Um, you know, once again, by the way, this, this is the lady of worker, not this one, this is the mother, the, the older children. Um, but again, it, in many of these countries, you find that uh, women, um, like more of my age are the ones that take this role, which is quite interesting. Um, there is hope, you know, because this idea about that, you know, we're getting older and there are more and more, you know, older people in the world and as if we can't do anything. Come on, you know, we can do things. <laughs> and, you know, it's just, you know, it's, it's there, you know. We, you know, it won't be too long before we're going to jump on and, and say, you know, we can take control of that. Of many things, be careful. <laughs> <laughs> what do they have in common? They say, well, small role for doctors, simple and low, low resource in, intensive, we use locally existing resources, improving local initiatives rather than creating something new. And all of them targeting socially deprived populations. Potential problems, so many, so many. I couldn't, but you know, I put them like I order them from individual level to things that are more related to the system. So there are lots of things about the system that does not help with the solutions that we are proposing. You know, you need kind of you know legislation. You have to be you know, kind of in tune with what is possible in every setting. Um, you, you need to provide rewards, incentives, so many things. What's in the future? Well, 
You may remember that I cut out the thing and I left that side out. And I think um, it is something that I have been into for the last five or six years. I've been doing a lot more technology. Now, just to make it easy for you, I've divided the things into um, strategies that use this, that we call standalone solutions, like sort of websites, app chatbots, which is when you're you know, a kid in town, the chatbots, which is essentially you pick up your phone and you can do something with it. You and your phone, the two of you alone in a row. What a wonderful romantic internet. <laughs> Uh, so that's one possibility, and then you have, you know, what I call the live contact or communication that can be by phone, can be by chatting, uh, Skype, many different things. And the thing which is probably attracting most attention now is what we call the blended intervention, in which you have a combination of uh, human interface and technology in whatever way you can think of. You know, in many of the countries in Africa, this is where we try to put the emphasis. Not only in Africa, in other countries. I'll show you a couple of examples. You know, why, why do I think it is important? Well, I'll tell you more later, but you know, uh, just for you to know, this is the curve, of, and this is a couple of years ago, or three years ago. Uh, but this is how the penetration of uh, a smartphone is happening in the world. And it doesn't really matter where in the world, it is increasing very rapidly. One mm, warning note, which comes here at the bottom. Did you know that about a third of all health apps are to do with mental health? I was surprised at that. About a third of all of them are to do with mental health. And about 1% of all the technological solutions have ever been tested. <laughs> ever. So it's all, you know, it's there. If you think it makes sense to you, use it. If not, leave it. Well, we've done a few of these things. We've just completed this one in Peru and Brazil, a very large randomized control trial, which is a blended intervention in which that is a an app that we give to the patient with depression. Mm -hmm. And then that app <coughs> communicates with the server, and the server sends information to two people, to a nurse that monitors what is going on and has some <coughs> algorithm that tells her what to do or not to do, and to a supervisor that will talk to the nurse and discuss a few cases. Nothing really, it's not kind of rocket science but and it worked and it worked and it worked very well actually um, hopefully you will see the results very soon um, this is another project we have in Brazil all the people you see here are community health workers and um, well I have to say that uh, she's a nurse but it is one of the things that happen when you go to places you know we were, um, this is a, um, a treatment program, a community treatment program for, um, you may be interested to say, <laughs> for elderly people uh, in the community in, in favelas, shanty towns in, in Brazil. And uh, when you go in there and you try, you, know, you go in there and you say, well, look, you know, we've developed this thing, we try it out, you know, it looks nice, you know, it seems to be working. Uh, we've done like two years work preparing all this stuff. And then, you know, you say, well, we're going to train the people who are going to deliver the thing, and this and that. And then a lot of people want to come along to the training. You know, well, you know, so the nurse said, you know, well, why don't you invite me to it? You know, I said, yeah, if you want, if you have the time, you want to come, by all means, come, you know, so you'll know what your community of workers are doing or not doing. Um, I think actually this one, this have a... They want to stay alone. <laughs> <laughs> now, to finish, just as I said at the beginning, like no, no health without mental health is like stating the obvious. 
restating the obvious, it comes to say, you know, resources are finite, and, uh, and demands are increasing rapidly. So to meet those two, it's the challenge of the future. Um, we don't know, but what we know is that what people are looking is for efficient solutions. When people talk about efficient, they often refer to resources rather than effectiveness. So that's why if you prepare cost effectiveness, I like it more myself, because there are lots of efficient things which are very ineffective, if not even detrimental. And, and that, to me, the future is that path will continue to be transferred. You know, this is fluid. It's, you know, we have to face it. You know, where are they going to be transferred to? I don't know. Will they be transferred to this other human being? Probably. Would technology take the place in there? Quite likely. Um, but I think that's where uh, things are moving. But that, you know, it's not really rocket science either. I mean, it's just quite likely. That's it. We're celebrating our 10 years at the center. Thank you so much for your attention. about one moment for, um, for some questions. Uh, has anybody got any reflections? I can see that Alan is biting for um, the opportunity. Really interesting um, I, just I just suddenly thought nobody can hear what you're saying. I've been told under, uh, we had to have a roving mic. Or oh, just stand and shout. Yeah, stand this is Professor shout. Alan Simpson, who is about to stand and shout. Uh, I just want to say, I really enjoyed the overview. And uh, my question is how uh, easy or difficult to do the actual research on those interventions. <laughs> <laughs> well, I arrived about an hour early, and I, and I was talking to my colleagues in here from different parts of the world, Fiona and others, uh, and they were telling me about all the nightmares of doing research. Um, in a natural, by the way, Alan and I are colleagues, we work in the same place, but I never see Alan there. So that's why he's asking the question here now. <laughs> he shouldn't have the right to ask a question. You know? <laughs> it, it, it is quite challenging, actually. There are so many things, you know, um, getting permission to do things, ethics, permission from the ministries, um, engaging people into what you want to do. You know, people are quite demoralizing them. It's just, you know, oh, here it is, another guy who's coming and, you know, trying to do a bit of research, you know, <laughs> okay. And so, what is going to be left in here for us? Nothing. Uh, it, it's, um, but, you know, I, I say that, but, you know, it's, um, I don't want to discourage you from doing this. On just the opposite, really. It's, when something happens, it's such a, a thrill. I can't explain to you. When you go to a place and you see people that never had anything, and you go in there and you get them excited about something which they feel it is their own thing because they participated in the design and development of the thing. And this is our solution to the thing, and we're going to try it with you. Thanks for coming. And you try it, and they see some sense in it. It's just a sense of, you know, at least for me, that is enough. All the jet lags in the world worth taking. And I think we'll take that message because very small acorns grow into beautiful trees and I think that's what every bit of a small research idea or an idea of a project actually always stems from. So I want to thank you so much um, and uh, we've really, really benefited from what you've had to say. Thank you. Thank you. You are just...